Uh, kia ora, Bulavanaka. Welcome back. And um, we are about to begin our session one for the Pacific Indigenous Peoples and Climate Crisis Workshop, Leveraging Lessons from the Front Lines. Uh, my name is Catherine Muripahinga Aiken, and I'm Senior Indigenous and Minorities Fellow with the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. Uh, regional office for the Pacific. So the session is um, titled Environmental Protection on Land and Underwater. And as the name suggests, the focus is on environmental protection, conservation, restoration, regeneration, and so on. Uh, we have a great lineup of speakers for the session, beginning with um, Ms. Mary Lawler, uh, who hails from Ireland and she is the UN Special Rapporteur on the situation of human rights defenders. Now, Mary was unable to um, attend in, pers um, in person or virtually uh, live with us today. So she has done a pre-recorded video message for us, um, which we will begin very shortly. Hello, thank you very much for having me speak to you today and I hope the day is coming where we can all begin to travel but so far since I took up the mandate nearly a year ago now I haven't been able to leave Dublin instead I've been listening to and talking to hundreds of human rights defenders from across the world including many in the Asia Pacific I am taking a people-centered approach to the mandate and defenders are regularly briefing me on the dangers they face, including in the context of COVID. I know that many face intimidation and attacks, including violence and arrest for the work that they do. The scramble for resources in the Pacific region puts those defending rights at great risk. We know that in some countries, laws limit the work of human rights defenders by restricting their right to peaceful assembly. And there are few laws that explicitly protect and promote the rights of human rights defenders. There is a lack of hard data on the status and situation of human rights defenders. As elsewhere in the world, those working on environmental rights are particularly at risk. My latest report to the UN Human Rights Council, which I presented last month, highlighted the murders of defenders across the world and the threats that often precede them. Environmental human rights defenders are at a particular risk for these attacks, and I have included as priorities for my mandate a focus on the most vulnerable defenders, including women human rights defenders, those working in isolated and remote areas, those working on environmental land and indigenous people's rights, and those defenders working on the climate crisis. My recent report to the Human Rights Council noted that environmental human rights defenders, those protesting land grab grabs and those defending the rights of people, including indigenous, indigenous people, sorry, by objecting to governments that are imposing business projects on the communities without free, or, free prior and informed consent are particularly vulnerable to attack. One in two victims of killings recorded in 2019 by Office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights had been working with communities around issues of land, environment, impacts of business activities, poverty, and the rights of indigenous peoples, Afro-descendants and other minorities. We know too that many of the threats and attacks against defenders in the Pacific region are gendered, and women human rights defenders are also, as I said, among my priorities. They are often attacked not just for what they do, but for who they are, and particularly when they defy cultural or social norms. Women human rights defenders in the region say they experience gender related violence directly linked to their human rights advocacy. 
I am also prioritizing the responsibilities of businesses in protecting human rights, and I have noted a worrying trend to silence those defenders criticizing business. In my report to the UN last month, I noted businesses have also responsibilities to protect human rights defenders, and many defenders are killed after protesting negative business impacts of business ventures. In too many cases, businesses are also shirking their responsibilities to prevent attacks on defenders or even perpetrators in these attacks. I see that the 2020 UN Pacific Forum on Business and Human Rights noted how the Pacific Island region plays host to sectors where the abuse of human rights by business actors is prevalent, if not common. Access to land and ocean resources is a major cause of conflict as corporations look to secure rights to harvest the wealth of the region's land and ocean. In many cases, the companies involved are multinational enterprises that are not based in the Pacific, but who nevertheless have operations there. This is sadly a familiar picture across the world, and I understand that the Pacific region many of these issues are particularly acute. Last year, I joined with other UN independent experts to raise issues arising from the separate development project in Papua New Guinea, noting that the project appeared to disregard the human rights of those affected. Regrettably, so far, there has been no response from the government of Papua New Guinea to our communication to them. My approach to the mandate is to try and engage with governments wherever I can, as I see the mandate as a bridge between human rights defenders and states. It is in that spirit that I will continue to listen to defenders and to communicate with governments. So far, all those conversations that I have had had to be online, but I hope I will be able to start traveling sometime soon and to meet with you and your government officials in person. Thank you for asking me to speak today again and good luck. Kia ora and we thank um, the special rapporteur, Miss Mary Lawler, as she hails from Ireland, Dublin Island. Um, and as she said, she is, uh, sending us a big signal that she's prepared to come to the Pacific as soon as the COVID situation allows. So let's put that in our back pocket, everybody, and think about um, how we might make that happen so she can come and um, explore some of the issues for our Pacific um, Indigenous peoples around the region. That's, that's great to know. Okay, um, moving on to our next speaker, and we have uh, Ms. Valmain Tuki. Um, and Valmain hails from the Māori Indigenous peoples of Ngāpuhi, Ngāti Wai and Ngāti Rehua in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, Valmain is now a senior lecturer at Te Piringa, the Faculty of Law at the University of Waikato uh, and is a former expert of the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. Uh, and she has presented reports on the relationship between Indigenous peoples and the Pacific Ocean, violence against Indigenous women and girls, and decolonization of the Pacific. Um, so Valmain, uh, with that short introduction, and feel free to fill in any other parts of your profile that you think are relevant um, for our listeners to know, um, and I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Valmain. Well, kia ora, Catherine, thank you. Uh, Bulavanaka, kia ora nga, talofa lava, tēnā koutou katoa. Nga mihi nui kia koutou. Greetings to my Indigenous brothers and sisters. Ko Valmain tuku o hau, a ngō Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, I'm delighted and privileged to be speaking with you today. The topic, um, as Catherine alluded to, is on environmental protection on land and underwater. I wanted to speak to, to two issues. First, to reiterate the importance and also the vulnerability of the Pacific. And secondly, highlight a couple of matters. So first, to seek a Pacific voice in UN oceans 
And this is triggered by the issue of extractive industries, which uh, Mary, uh, the previous speaker, sort of touched on. And sec secondly, related to this, to seek a Pacific voice to protect our oceans. And this is triggered by a marine dumping case, which I'll speak to at the end of um, my presentation this, this morning. So first, how, how important is the Pacific? Well, we know the Pacific covers uh, roughly 30% of the Earth's surface. It's the biggest and deepest of the planet's ocean basins. And oceans absorb about 30% of the carbon dioxide produced by humans, thereby buffering the impacts of global warming. Therefore, it's, it's no surprise that oceans serve as a critical component of the world's ecosystem. So prudent management of the world's ocean is a key feature for a sustainable future. Indigenous peoples rely on the oceans, uh, the seabed and associated environments for food, health, economic activities, and also cultural practices. And for indigenous peoples, the scope of our rights to our lands, territories, and oceans is not limited to the orthodox perception of a sea boundary, but extends to the seabed as well. For us, there's no distinction between lands above and lands below our waters. It's, it's all whenua, it's all, all land. So activities that have an adverse or negative impact on the oceans will have a disastrous effect on the health, lives, economies, and cultures of indigenous peoples, which in turn will only exacerbate the already poor living conditions and life expectancy for future generations. The importance of the oceans to indigenous peoples of the Pacific cannot be overstated. Yet, the ability to <coughs> excuse me, the ability to meaningfully participate in decision making on matters that will have a direct impact on oceans and on our environments is limited. So this leads me nicely to the second point, and that's about governance and seeking a Pacific voice. Governance of the oceans and its environments is pivotal to the cultures, health and welfare of all indigenous peoples, in particular, those of the Pacific region. Now this relationship is emphasized in the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So we look at article three, which provides that indigenous peoples have the right of self-determination and that by virtue of that right, they freely determine their political status and freely pursue their economic, social and cultural development. So together with additional articles of the declaration, not only recognize that indigenous peoples have the right to maintain and strengthen their distinctive spiritual relationship with their traditionally owned or otherwise occupied and used lands, territories, waters, and coastal seas, but also provides clear grounds for the rights of indigenous peoples in the Pacific region to govern, govern their ocean, right? Therefore, any activity that takes place within Indigenous peoples traditionally owned lands or territories, such as seabed mining, requires that free prior informed consent. That right was also mentioned by Mary, um, the, the, our first speaker. Now, in addition, states are required to recognize and protect these lands and resources and provide effect, effective mechanisms for redress and also take steps to mitigate any adverse impacts. And furthermore, indigenous peoples have the right to protect and conserve their environment, including fish stocks, seabed and mineral deposits, and states must take steps to ensure this right. So the declaration explicitly states, in addition to this, that any legislation or administrative measures such as the granting of seabed mining licenses require that free, prior and informed consent of indigenous peoples. Right, so even though I've set out quite nicely what the declaration provides, despite these clear fundamental rights being recognized within the declaration, despite this, right, the current actions and inactions and contracts agreed to by the International Seabed Authority and UN Oceans are clear evidence that recognition and consideration of indigenous people's rights and their inclusion in decision making is, is simply not, not occurring. So in light, so what we need is we need a, a greater voice in that space. Um, and in light of the underlying philosophy of sustainability by which indigenous peoples live, 
you know, it's, it's imperative that these rights be embraced rather than sidelined, which is happening at the moment. So my first recommendation is that uh, Indigenous peoples of the Pacific are provided a meaningful voice at the decision-making table in all organisations, including the International Seabed Authority, particularly when consideration of an activity, for instance, mineral extraction, within Indigenous peoples traditionally owned or otherwise occupied and used land as sought. Secondly, uh, the, the flip side of this right is the Pacific voice to protect our oceans. So I, I live in a small island 50 nautical miles east of Aotearoa, New Zealand. And when a commercial company was granted consent to dump marine waste near my whenua without adequate procedural, let alone substantive consideration of iwi, indigenous peoples, we had no option as a small iwi but to litigate. This is not ideal for various reasons. It's not only incredibly costly, so everyone's doing this action for koha or for aroha, but it's, it's time consuming. Uh, we're against companies with deep pockets and huge resources. It's very stressful. And uh, when you get into a court of law, the likelihood of success is quite low. Um, however, in this instance, when we're challenging that granting of consent to a big commercial uh, organization to extract, not, not just extract, but also to dump marine waste, uh, we were fortunate to secure a positive outcome, which resulted in that commercial company withdrawing their application to dump 250,000 cubic meters annually for 35 years near, near our whenua. So therefore my second recommendation, uh, which ties into the front end of my presentation, would be, I think a repetition of the first in that, indigenous peoples of the Pacific are provided a meaningful voice at the decision-making table in all organizations, including the International Seabed Authority, particularly when consideration of an activity, and in this case, marine dumping, within Indigenous peoples traditionally owned or otherwise occupied lands is sought. Um, so that, those, that's all I really wanted to say, but um, in conclusion, uh, the tikanga of Indigenous peoples guides them, right, to act in a way that protects and sustains the environment. And it's, it's as simple as, you know, if we look after Papa Tōnuku or Pachamama, Earth Mother, then, then she will in turn look after, uh, after us. However, to achieve this, Indigenous people need to be at the decision-making table to ensure that this approach is, is taken and respected. Uh, nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Kia ora Valmain. that was um, very uh, succinct in terms of making recommendations that we can take away from this workshop. It's obvious that there are many foreign um, companies uh, and states, nation states even, that covet what our Pacific has and they would want to come here and extract our resources. So we have to be, we can discuss that a bit more in the, the Q&A, but I think that's very very um, an important point to um, just park so we can have a bit of an exploration around that risk because it's very real. So thank you and now we'll move to our third and for today this is our final um, speaker on our panel, Mr. Willie Misak and, and Willie comes to us today as an advisor to the Vanuatu Climate Action Network Secretariat. Um, Mr. Misak is also the National Biodiversity Conservation Specialist at the UN Food and Agricultural Organization in Vanuatu. Uh, he received the Queen's Young Leader Award in 2015 and was a recipient of the Royal Commonwealth Society Associate, Associate Fellowship in Vanuatu. So um, Willie, it's uh, lovely to have you join us and I will hand the floor over to you. Kia ora. Hi, thank you for, thank you for the opportunity. Um, and uh, thank you for the, uh, um, the uh, introduction as well. Um, for this, um, uh, discussion that we have today. Um, I think um, in a perspective where we're looking at the indigenous right and uh, indigenous people in the Pacific, um, I will share this, uh, this perspective in, uh, from the Vanuatu uh, uh, from the Vanuatu's uh, perspective. 
um, when we're looking at indigenous rights, and uh, I'm, I'm echo uh, uh, the colleague that uh, just talked about um, uh, looking at the free prior informed consent from the uh, communities and indigenous people that are in the communities while looking at developments in the, um, whether at the grassroots level or national or even provincial level. Uh, having the free prior informed uh, consent from the um, indigenous people is one of the, uh, the thing that um, many uh, developments, for instance, in Vanuatu uh, are facing the challenge of having that free by informed consent. And um, it's also looking at how the, the indigenous people are restructuring and supporting the development, whether from the national or the, uh, the grassroots level. Um, in, 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 in Vanuatu and uh, surely from the, uh, 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 looking at all the different Pacific uh, culture that we have, uh, looking on, on that indigenous right is uh, something that um, uh, the, the, the governments have struggled as well to, uh, to, to conserve uh, th those rights. Um, just uh, recently uh, on Sunday, uh, looking, uh, celebrating the, the world, um, world language uh, uh, day, the Vanuatu government is, is also looking at this um, uh, a preservation of the language which preserve uh, the indigenous right uh, in it. And um, it becomes a, a sort of challenging time when we're looking at, at the current COVID-19 and the, the development that is going on in the, in the countries and also the impact of the climate change. We can see that indigenous people are very touched and are, are very affected by uh, most of those different, um, uh, different um, uh, uh, th those different um, uh, impact, whether it's from the COVID-19 uh, or in, in from the, the um, uh, climate change. And when we're looking at uh, the, the development uh, that is going on, that those impact uh, from, the, um, the, from the development side um, is also something that we, we have to learn from and see how we can really build um, the voice of the indigenous people so that uh, they are, is, is respected and also their right on, on contributing on the development of their own communities or within their own countries. Um, uh, the, when, when we're talking about uh, looking at how the, the indigenous people are developing and contributing on the development of a country, um, sometimes we, we come, especially when, when we're looking at the, we have that lens of uh, development. Um, we are really concerned about how well, a government spends uh, the, the money to, to contribute on the development of a country or uh, a community, or how the government or private organizations or private sectors are contributing on that. And looking on that money perspective, uh, sometimes it's lower our, our, um, our, our, our global way of looking at or, uh, or looking on the general perspective of how we we contributing on the, the life of indigenous people in, in our in our countries and in our communities as well. So um, I think for this uh, this discussion that we have, it's really important that we 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 also contributing on supporting the governments in the Pacific, especially when it comes to development, or especially when it comes to different impact of climate change, how we are protecting our uh, our indigenous people, because at the end, we all indigenous people whether you're working from an organization on the international organizations, whether you're working from the government, whether you're working from um, a, a, a local uh, government, we will be, we are all indigenous people in, 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 our, uh, in our way of living. Once we finish, for example, I will one day finish work with the FAO and I will return back to the community. Protecting the indigenous right now is protecting our indigenous people for the future and also protecting our future culture and preserving our culture for our future generations as well. And by protecting it, it will contribute uh, massively on the protection of our environment because of the culture that the indigenous people have. And also it's contributing on the preservation of the language that we have in our own uh, countries. And also in is, is, uh, is contributing on developing the respect and also love the environment that is around us. And I think that having the, the, 
the prior or, or pre prior informed concern from the communities and the indigenous people really allow enhance uh, the uh, the perspective of protecting our uh, heritage, our cultural heritage, and also protecting our environment for our future generations. Thank you very much. Kia ora, Willie, and um, it's uh, great to have uh, these um, panelists such as yourself um, who are coming from all different parts of the Pacific uh, to show, even though it's a unique experience, we actually have a lot in common and how we are at our different front lines, right? So we have people in the room physically in Suva in the audience who are on their particular front lines um, working away at um, supporting and protecting human rights and we have ones online as well who are doing it in their particular way. Just because the title to this um, workshop was on the front lines, let's not think of ourselves as just um, we're the fisher folk, we're in our gardens doing uh, food security, you know, we're protecting our soils and that sort of thing. There's a whole variety, like you said, you could be working in a government agency, you could be working for a um, an NGO uh, in a business, in particular business. So um, thank you very much, Willie. So uh, now we come to the part where we would invite uh, questions and comments from our audience for our panelists. And um, I actually have one which our um, team has just sent through to me. I think this might be the intention is to share this question and it's actually uh, addressed to Val Main. Uh, and the question is um, whether you could, Val Main, just provide a bit more of an overview in terms of how your community managed to win your case against the company. We hope that was the outcome. I believe that it was successful <laughs> um, to uh, dump waste in your area. Um, some practical advice or insights. And you mentioned there were definitely some challenges. So um, yeah, if you had anything further to add, Valmain, kia ora. Sure, I'm happy to, to fill in fill in the gaps there. So what happened was the was um, Coastal Resources Limited applied for a consent to to dump 250,000 cubic meters of marine sludge. Um, that, so that's sludge they sort of dug up from marinas and berths and um, other similar places. And once they got the sludge, it was like, well, we're, you know, personal resources said, well, we're not going to dump it, you know, in the, the same backyard. Let's just dump it over you know, over where we are, which is 50 nautical miles east of Auckland. And so they said, okay, we'll just apply for consent from as bizarre as the name may seem, the Environmental Protection Agency. And we'll, we'll apply for consent to dump all this uh, marine sludge out the back over there where no one else, you know, no one else kind of really knows or no one else really goes or no one else really sees. And it's so, such a draconian uh, approach to dealing with waste. It's sort of like sweeping it under someone else's carpet, so and, and then it'll it'll all just it'll all go away, and but you see because you know Māori are, are feisty a lot and the litigious lot, we said you know hang on ha how come why are you dumping all this waste which didn't come from our door here at all or our region but someone else's region for someone else's pleasure or access and we're we're going to be left with all this all this dumping material which could possibly contain um, you know adverse kind of biodiversity um, enzymes and things like that and it's going to not just stifle our kaimoana beards but have that negative impact on on our on our, on our sea on our kaimoana and and also on our culture right so we said okay this can't happen we went to the first stage at the regional council and we said, look, this can't happen. But of course, they were very clever. They had lots of money. Um, they had lined up scientists and, and other, um, other sort of groups to support their application. So, so we tried it the first hurdle and we didn't succeed. And the next step from there was taking it to the high court in a judicial review action 
to review the decision making of, of EPA to grant consent. And that was our only option left. Um, so that's, I suppose, the, um, um, the academic approach we had to take. Um, but behind the lines, of course, we had the community and and I've always thought that if we were going to ever win this case, it would be driven by the community. And that's that's an important component that I actually left out. So we um, organised um, hui, we organised a, a protest down our main street in Auckland, um, and we had media involved to highlight this draconian measure of dumping waste um, out in a pristine area where we, where we live. So it was a... It was an approach on lots of different fronts um, with the legal avenue really as I don't want to say the last measure because it was important because it actually stopped that consent proceeding. But additionally and equally as important was the community support um, that came behind, behind our case. And it actually um, galvanized the community against against this approach. And that was, so amongst this silver, I mean, this cloud, there was this, the silver lining was that the community came together and said, no, we can't have this marine sludge within our, you know, dump within our environs. We have to come together. This is indigenous and non-indigenous, by the way, to, to fight this. So we had the community avenue to the protest, the um, platform to a way uh, to, raise awareness of the activity. And at the same time, we had the legal challenge and the formal legal challenge that uh, was proceeding. The legal challenge was a heck of a lot harder. We were up against QCs, we were up against legal chambers. So there was just little old us in one corner and lawyers and chambers for Coastal Resources Limited, which was the dumping, um, the people who were granted consent, the dumping people plus lawyers for the Environmental Protection Agency. So it was, it was like the whole, you know, David and Goliath kind of approach. But, you know, but nonetheless, you know, we, you know, we were, uh, it was a real, it was a principal tikanga approach we took. And it's about standing up for, you know, your environment, standing up for uh, community, standing up for indigenous rights. And when the state won't recognize fundamental rights, such as free, prior and informed consent, we have no other option but to, come together as a community to protest, um, make use of that platform and additionally um, take the legal avenue. So yeah. Amazing, I mean, thank you very much for that detail. It's got me thinking, but I will park my further questions so that we might, with the assistance of our colleagues in the room in Suva, um, take some questions from the floor. Naka Catherine, Bula. It's silly. <clears throat> um, I think uh, I, I just want to, this is a general question um, on environment protection and on land and especially underwater. For us in Fiji, um, the issue of, um, should I say, the inconsistency of um, um, the protection of, we normally call, we call ourselves LOUs, land owning units. These are the Matangalis, the Avuses, who owns resources. And um, from the years, I look through the room, I see there's a group of uh, women from Enganake here. Um, now, the, 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 the issue here is on marine protected areas. Um, and we, this is, I, I must thank uh, the office for this, um, for this workshop. Uh, and I notice also a few students here. My, my first uh, question to the academy is, um, I'm crossing my fingers, what's the possibility, because um, Kathy, you and I have been uh, conversing uh, behind the scenes. Uh, on, I, I'm really, really pleading if we could push from the recommendation that we have from these two days to push further. I'm just looking at the strategically on the future for our 
for our students. I know there's a few here in the room to really go into like something like on a South-South partnership to really sink down into some of the critical recommendations that will come out uh, for these uh, two days. And one I would like to particularly address is on um, marine protected areas. Now this is where we push it a little bit from what the technical people knows as to split from the offshore and the inshore. I'm, I'm, we will talk a little bit on the, the inshore. For us Fijians, one, one for the last, last November, last December, October, there was a big issue of a Chinese company that started to dig the whole reef in the Sawa. Now that, that's in this room that resonates when I mentioned that. And uh, for the Lao Islands, right now in another conference, which I ran away from, the whole of one province, Lao, they established the seascape. It will be officially launched by the Honorable Prime Minister, hopefully in one of these rooms this Friday. Now they are already talking about what is the issue when we are trying to enhance community level climate change resilience and the current administration for us right now, I don't want to talk politics this morning, the issue of state ownership of this mangrove forest. And we see the, the digging of these mangroves. And these women from Wanganaka here and most of the women, that is their daily livelihood. And one thing that I didn't hear from the past uh, speakers on the psychology, the, the, the psychological stresses that comes with this, especially when we are talking about solo mothers, when you're talking about uh, one sole breadwinner. I mean, I'm really talking, these are the frontline issues, the really dominant silent ones that I really need to bring out. I actually will be sharing this more tomorrow morning uh, when I share my story. Another issue, please uh, give me another two minutes. Another, another issue is on the incompatibility when there is a big timer. A big timer here is like a, a big transnational corporation coming. Uh, I don't know whether there is one from Bua in the room, uh, the bauxite mining in Bua, where they just come and dig the soil. They didn't process it here. They take the whole soil to China. I don't want to mention names here. But those, those are the things. I was there last week with them. And there is this dominant silent story coming up from the mothers. Now, those are, I'm sorry, let me translate that. Um, uh, they've come and dig all our soil. When we die, where will we go and be buried? Because there's no more soil. Those are the critical issues for us. So what is, what is actually the, the, I really hope when one of those firm recommendations will come in for us to really move and drive this forward. One, the importance of spirituality for us to keep it. And also the consultation, the strategic consultation, the community level with the current government for us in terms of creating this, what I will call, um, enabling an inclusive policy, renovative um, uh, refinement so that uh, through your good office of the UN uh, human rights, these, these things will probably come dominant in the next few years. Binaka Kathy. A great intervention there, um, Sully, and uh, I would want to maybe offer to our panelists um, to give some reflections on the issues that's raised. It, it sounds quite desperate in, in some situations. And uh, we actually, our final panel today will be talking about UN system engagement to raise awareness and bring accountability around such violations as the ones you have mentioned. But for the meantime, if Willie or Valmain uh, had some um, thoughts on, on the points that uh, our speaker has raised there. 
I'm, I'm happy to, to try and address. Yeah, really, really great points. And thank you for, um, for your intervention and um, what you were saying. And yeah, you know, Indigenous women, we face a lot of, a lot of challenges. Um, and, you know, I, I don't even know where to start um, with respect to that. But if I can just go, um, firstly, talk about um, MPAs and marine protected areas. Um, and sort of draw an analogy with what's happening here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. We have the state um, putting together marine protected areas. And, you know, as, in, as Māori, we have to sort of go along with what the New Zealand government, um, you, know, they, you know, they want. Um, and it's a real challenge for Māori to say, well, okay, it's really great. We have these marine protected areas to bring back the Kaimawana and things like that. But, you know, how about our customary rights? How about our customary rights in terms of the fishing that we've already uh, we've established, you know, might are not within that area. You know, are you gonna are you gonna tell us that we can't fish fish there anymore? So, it, and that's it's a constant struggle, right, for the for the state to meaningfully turn their minds to understand um, indigenous peoples, and and it's not to say that we're going to take all the resources that we're going to um, you know take take everything because we know as indigenous peoples if we we have to live sustainably because if we take all the muscle, if we take all the fish, then there's nothing left for us to eat, right? So we we look after the environment, and I just I just don't think the state understands, you know, meaningfully understands that position we have as Indigenous peoples, and whether it's uh, control or power um, relationship, I'm not sure, but that that has to change, right? That has to change, and they need to listen to us and have open open ears and um, the, the mental health aspect you talk about, you know, that's just almost great for my heart. I have to go back to what I was saying that we need to be at the table to say, hang on a minute, you can't keep doing this because it's negatively impacting on our culture and creating, you know, mental health issues for our women um, and, you know, the, the bauxite is another, you know, the transnational companies and the extraction of bauxite is another um, different but related issue that, you know, it can't, can't continue because, you know, we would, you know, as Indigenous peoples, we wouldn't sort of undertake that activity. So, you know, why are we allowing transnational companies to come in, come in and, and do that? So, um, yeah, so th those are just my really quick, I suppose, reflections on, on what you were saying. And I just like to thank you for, for raising that and, you know, bringing reality and practicality um, to, to the table. So thank you. Kia ora, and uh, could I just quickly, Valmain, while we have you there, um, the permanent forum, uh, their meeting is happening um, beginning the 19th of this month a two week session, um, but as an institution, as a space for indigenous peoples, um, what kind of value is there for our, our, our indigenous communities to engage there, to raise awareness there, um, to maybe seed some flags? Because I know there are so many different agencies, there are, the business sector turns up, other NGOs turn up. So we're talking about, um, we heard an example of like the partnering that happened in your particular case. It wasn't just Indigenous peoples, but we had all of the community, you know, coming together from different um, walks of life for your case to be more um, successful and generate more attention. So it's, n it's not like Indigenous peoples need to do this alone, um, or even if we do it alone, we'll probably not have the highest chance of success, right? So um, yeah, just I just wanted to flag about the permanent forum. If people in the audience um, weren't aware of that mechanism um, and what value it, it might have. Thanks, Chris. Um, just some comments and reply. Yeah, the permanent forum is a is a really good opportunity to come to collectively together as Indigenous peoples. But you'll know um, in the general assembly, they're not only Indigenous peoples organisations in the room, but the states and UN agencies. So it's an opportunity for Pacific peoples under the Pacific Caucus to come together and say, okay, and strategize and say, you know, what, what are the key, key issues that we want to collectively address? Okay, we've got them. So should we go and talk to 
the, like, um, sorry, the government of Fiji. Should we go and talk to the government of Vanuatu? Because they're in the, they're in the room at the same time. So it, it would be beneficial to take advantage of that opportunity. Uh, and that's separate to, being, to providing interventions to the permanent forum that could potentially be captured in the, in the report that's eventually tabled with the UN Human Rights, Human Rights Council that uh, Mary spoke about at the front end of the, um, the session. So there are, there are definitely ways that we can strategize as specific peoples not um, only Indigenous, but also non-Indigenous peoples to come together as a community and say, we don't want extractive industries. We don't, we, you know, and if there is going to be extractive industries, we want to understand the adverse effect they could have on our communities. And, and what's important to us, we don't want the mental health of our women being adversely impacted on. We need to sort of highlight that and be uh, strategic about protecting that. And, it's, you know, there's, there's many ways to skin a cat, but it's having the energy and um, the, the right approach to, to achieve that. Um, so, so yeah, I'm happy to answer any more questions about that. But the Permanent Forum is a really good opportunity to, to come together and share commonalities, make interventions, talk to the states who are in the same room um, as a collective um, and yeah, be strategic. Kia ora um, I see, uh, Willie, you're, uh, you're back um, on camera. Did you have any thoughts you wanted to offer at this point? Yeah, I think uh, um, I, I, I want to thank the, the comment that is, is coming out. And uh, this is also, it, it's a particular way that we can see across the Pacific. Uh, the Pacific. And um, there is uh, so much development that is going on. And most of the development is also leading by Chinese companies, and um, which is good for, for the de development. But uh, at the same time, looking at um, the, the, the rights of the indigenous people is, is something that um, our governments in Vanuatu, uh, in, in, in the Pacific, uh, need to also think about it. Um, and um, as uh, I mentioned earlier, when we're looking at how also, uh, the United Nations is also supporting that, uh, according to all the different indigenous um, uh, uh, conventions that are, that are in place. Um, in in Vanuatu, we are we are trying with the uh, uh, the, the FAO. We are trying to work very closely with uh, with the government to to ensure that that the voice of the indigenous people are also uh, respected when it comes to development. Um, uh, for example, when we're looking at developing the conservation areas across uh, in, in Vanuatu. Um, we, we take this, um, we, we are following that um, the process of the, the free prior informed consent in the communities and we invite the government to also sit in that, uh, in that space where we talk with the, um, the community leaders, the community uh, people in the, um, uh, we, we, uh, with uh, the people in the communities to really have their concern about how this development is going on. But we also come to that point that we realize that uh, sometimes um, we as indigenous people or people from the community, uh, we, we allow that by not, uh, by not um, knowing that it will be impacting our environment in the long term as well. And this is the other, the other side of the coin where we also trying to, to understand in that perspective where how we, we, we create a governance system in the community that really protect the, the indigenous uh, uh, culture and the indigenous way of um, living in a community and also uh, providing that way of development when it comes to um, community uh, voices or indigenous voice. Uh, why I mentioned about that? Because when we're looking at uh, us, I know that in Vanuatu and across uh, the other Pacific Islands that we have that um, cultural, um, uh, governance that in place we are where we have chiefs and then we have um, other community leaders and we come to realize that sometimes um, some sort of uh, development that has been allowed by the indigenous people is not by the voice of the indigenous people but is from um, a chiefs and the community and we we see that lack of consultation among the indigenous people themselves as well so there's two part of it when we when we're looking at that but and in terms of the development where we're looking at uh, 
of course, across the Pacific, we see um, Chinese government supporting all the development on road developments, uh, ring road developments uh, in the Pacific. And this is something that also uh, in, in Vanuatu, for example, we are looking at that. We have, and uh, I know that in Fiji, we have all these uh, environmental impact um, assessment uh, procedures that are in place and is also binding by the law uh, from the government. And this is something where we encourage the community to, to also uh, creating the space of where they, they themselves discuss about the importance of their own environment, linking with their heritage, cultural heritage, linking with their beliefs, linking with how they are living and linking to the future generations, thinking about the long term of the future generation, how this culture will be um, transmitted from generation to generation and be protected as well. So by looking on that, we, we encourage in, in indigenous uh, uh, communities, people that to, to also create a covenants that will be protected, that we will be really protecting that right and voicing their voices. And we have that uh, in, in the Pacific Islands, we are so fortunate to have some offices in Fiji, we have the human rights office, the UN human rights office, where we can go and consult with, with them as well, using those opportunities and those spaces to really speak uh, speak out what we what is happening and as we know uh, enforcing the, the the government laws in terms of protecting the uh, the environment or protecting the indigenous right is also something that is recognized by the constitutions for example in Vanuatu is recognized by that and i know that across the all the pacific islands we have the constitutions that is to protecting our cultural heritage and protecting uh, the indigenous people and um uh, from from that perspective, um, what we are what we are doing is we we really work close with the, with the government with those communities to make sure that we put in place a government system that will be uh, allowing the consultation among the, the community people or the indigenous people in a village or in a community, so that they can consult and have to think about and really have concern to raise their consciousness about uh, their concern on how they. They protect their own um, uh, culture and um, even their, their rights at the community level. And um, uh, you, you mentioned about the uh, marine protected area. Um, when we are we are working with the communities in Vanuatu, for example, with the FAO team, um, we we try to help them also understand that uh, to, to looking at where their rights are, are limited. Uh, when we're talking about the marine protected area. There's some 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 spaces where when we go beyond that, for example, when we start talking about the EEZ, uh, it's really challenging for us uh, as um, at the community level or as indigenous people to to looking beyond that. And this is where we can uh, at least agree that this is where the government will looking at the EEZ the, beyond um, the uh, the coral reefs beyond yeah um, uh, beyond where we as indigenous people can protect. And this is the other thing that we, 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 we try to also make sure that the communities are also understanding that, that uh, of course we have right to the sea uh, and uh, there is some limits where we, we, we cannot go beyond that. And also when we're looking at, for example, the, the laws of the country, when you're talking about the, the mining, and it's also addressable to, to us, how we, we protect the, the, the land where we cultivate or developing our cultures. And there is some limit on all of that as well. When we go beyond 100 meters, and this is beyond our capacity as the indigenous people to protect. Uh, and, and this is where we have to really looking at protecting the first uh, uh, layers of the, of the ground, for example, where the mining will be happening. And, and I think uh, we, uh, from that experience that we, we see, and I'm, I'm sure that um, across the, the, the uh, uh, the Pacific, we are we are a small countries and we are small people and um, we we know nearly everyone in our communities and even people from the the government we know that uh, they will surely once finish and retire they will return back to the communities and live this life of indigenous but we have to protect we we have to protect that for for the for the for future generation as well so um, it, it, it's a very good question um, thank Kilda, you very Kilda much. Thank you for those reflections, very down to earth. And uh, I mean, you, 
you've made uh, the point, and I think many of our speakers have that, um, there are many forms of wealth besides money for our people. That's the thing. We can't uh, just engage with corporations on the basis of money because our water is our um, wealth, our food, our soils, our culture is our wealth. And uh, until business and industry get that, I, I think we'll be talking at cross purposes. They have to be able to understand Indigenous people's wealth to, to us um, more uh, comprehensively for us to have a meaningful engagement and of course the protections obligations of states and businesses themselves i, I see we have um a a question in the chat if i might call from catherine levy um to we'll, we'll, we're going to try and see if she can um articulate her question speak a question uh with hello. her internet connection <laughs> Kia ora, hello, catherine hello hello to everybody um, yeah, well, thank you. Thank you for this. I'm really enjoying the chat. Uh, I'm based in Brisbane. My connection is very poor. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Um, yeah, so I've uh, been living and um, working in Papua New Guinea for a very long time as a linguist uh, first. So I, I was really, I still am working uh, really at grassroots level and a lot with women. And a lot with women who uh, were um, resisting to domestic violence, so survivors, accusations, um, violence related to accusations of sorcery. And what struck me is that their concerns were very similar to the ones of women on other parts of the world, because I was following them more on websites than uh, indigenous women in South America and North America. And I was just wondering if, you know, getting together. So my question is, uh, I don't know if you have seen it, right? We are more vulnerable because of small numbers and dispersion, right? Where the big companies have, they have a block, they have each other's back, right? So we're facing these this, uh, giants. And I was wondering if our vulnerability on this side could be alleviated by indigenous people from across the world coming together and becoming a, a stronger force. You know, like if now we are the tip of the iceberg and turn around the iceberg, because there's other people who might be sympathetic. I'm thinking of um, uh, organizations that deal with climate change, protection of nature, but even also community development, fair trade, all that is linked. Yeah, so anyway, it was a vision I had um, and I was I'll put it there for discussion. Excellent, excellent uh, question there. So it's recognizing that our small communities uh, and also geographically, we are spread uh, across the region in ways that other, other regions, indigenous peoples, they don't have that same issue to contend with. You know, we have to uh, communicate between uh, perhaps small islands and maybe we don't have the communication infrastructure that other areas are privileged to have. So it's that added barrier for us to mobilize right this is what it's about we've got to mobilize because if we don't necessarily have a lot of the money uh, we have to leverage other power that we have those other superpowers that we have and one of them definitely is our ability to build relationships and networks so that's a big question i think from this workshop how do we build those networks in a way that we can then be a force to be reckoned with when we have these intrusions on our human rights, our, those violations on our human rights. Um, I, I'd like to perhaps put that, um, is there anyone in the room who has a, a comment on that? Because it seems to be like one of the most difficult things for our Pacific as a region to actually create that cohesive, mobilized force. Um, so. Thanks, Catherine. We have, we have a comment from the room. I'm just gonna pass over. Um, sorry, Catherine, I, th I think my comment really wasn't related to uh, that, but, but uh, as, uh, well, Piango, uh, we work uh, in 24 countries and we do a lot of that, collective support, uh, probably something that we can work uh, together to have a collective statement or something of that sort. Uh, with that being said, I'll like to just make a quick comment. Uh, first off, thank you so much to the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights for allowing 
this space for us to just sit and you know having uh, the the space to have this conversation around indigenous rights and the struggles that we go through and also to the panelists uh, for a very comprehensive uh, presentation thank you so much for that uh, I think my comment really is around protection um, I believe that safeguarding is all about um, uh, inclusiveness empowerment um, collaboration but most importantly protection uh, I'd like to just echo uh, what my uh, fellow colleague has suggested to earlier with regards to um, the recommendations so I think my comment would be um, if from this two days workshop we're looking at a resolution or a recommend recommendation um, if we could somehow I uh, think about uh, social challenges that the indigenous people go through on a day-to-day -day basis. I also worked in the in Bua a few years back, working around. Um, I did a few researches around bauxite mining, and some of the few uh, social challenges that we noticed were um, young um, young girls getting pregnant from these uh, mine workers. Uh, we also had um, uh, these workers actually renting in, in homes within the village boundaries that actually caused a lot of uh, uh, fragmentations uh, between uh, villages. And also we had our landowners bribed. You know, they were given $2,000, come into hotels. And, and, and this caused a lot of uh, I would say conversations that led to their lens being signed off. So probably just putting it out there, if we could, you know, could think about this as a resolution or a recommendation once we come to the end of this two days workshop. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, intervention. And I'm just going to uh, lean on my colleagues in the room. Rob, uh, are there any other questions uh, in the room before we Maybe think yes, about another comment over here in question. Just one second. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much. I can I can ask my before more I can ask my question. I want to thank the United Nations Human Rights for us to to come here today for the workshop. And uh, my question is uh, a dump. That is my comment. A dump, they dump in the sea. To, but I want to stop in center proceeding for that, for this workshop because of the marine. We stay in the village, in Wenganake village. We are here today to know because uh, dumping. So I heard the dumping today because uh, we stay in the village, plenty dump, plenty rubbish. In the city area, hotel areas, we collection in the village, in the sea, in the village. Eh? And uh, I want to know why about that. And I want to see what they are, but we in the village, we are making all the seafood to collect the few seafood from the reef and then bring it to the market every day. Start from Monday to Saturday. And uh, we doesn't like the, that matter because uh, we clean it. Everything we sell in the market, we clean it in the marine. That's a, I'm talking about marine, eh? because uh, we are in the village uh, opposite Suba. We are in the harbor of Suba. And we collect all the things in the reef, all the stuff, or all the seafood in the reef to sell in the market, come and sell in the market. Before selling in the market, we just uh, clean it, clean it very clean and bring it to the market to sell for the people. They want the seafood. We're selling all the seafood food in the market. 
but my comment now i want to i don't want to dump in the marine side so we that's why we come today i am the women's coordinator i want everything must clean because we don't want Suva area or city or area or any hotel to dump in the in the sea because our our staff or our marine staff we bring it in the she sells and everything we bring it in the market to come and sell because uh, that's very very bad habit for us to see that when we are cleaning everything every dirty or every the dump the rubbish they come along in the in the wenganake village eh? Wenganake village is opposite so we use all the marine fish octopus and everything in the market we sell uh, that's what i want to can you explain very hard to ask about we know about the dump <laughs> uh, excuse about us today thank you thank you very much um, for raising that situation here so everybody can hear um, and I'm sure over the lunch breaks, all the breaks, um, we'll be thinking about these questions and also how we might shape some recommendations, as our other colleagues said, to go with this workshop report when we're done over the next um, two days. And we'll um, hopefully have some action points, quite targeted ones that we can take as follow up to this workshop on the issues that we've raised. So again, thank you very much.